And Welcome. If you take 10 more paces west from there, I guarantee that you'll find absolutely everything. You Oh, we're recording. <laughs> oh, no. At least that's Shh. it. <laughs> so welcome to Café Rolliste. Uh, I am here with Paddy. Paddy, could you briefly introduce yourself? And I don't actually know that much about you, so I'm going to find out a lot today. Oh, well, that's all right. I guess I'm an enigma. Uh, hey, folks, I'm Paddy Hutchinson coming at you live from Peachy One in the Morning here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, that is... Uh, Occupied uh, Wurundjeri turf, if I'm remembering. Uh, sorry, uh, Wurundjeri turf, if you're, I'm remembering correctly. Um, so yes, I am the main host and primary producer over at the Liberation Industries Role Playing Podcast. Well, it was originally a podcast, but we've sort of diversified into different streaming projects as the um, as the pandemic has worn on. Uh, and I was also recently the host of uh, Game Dunk Online, which was a big game. Des well, I say big; it was big for our little community. A, I will say, a successful uh, game design jam that we had uh, that we held online back in July. So, um, yeah, it's. I sit down here at the bottom of the world, and uh, things are getting interesting. Like we've uh, had a lot of practice on hosting online events the last little while, given how stringent our lockdown has been. But uh, yeah, I need to be more aware of the. I mean, on one hand, I'd like to be more aware of all the conventions which are taking place online. On the other hand, uh, Dragon Meat here is the physical convention in London. That's our mm -hmm. convention. They announced that they were going online, and <laughs> I'm in full online convention fatigue <laughs> because I've been to mm. to so many, trying to run my game there. Trying to engage with people, but plus dealing with uh, life, which is also complicated. So Dragon Meat is coming, and I'm like, uh, I don't have the heart to offer my services for a panel. I might run a game. I'd like mostly to play games, but I'm I'm exhausted. To especially mm. since each online convention, until further notice, you need to relearn everything each time because they mm -hmm. all have. A different platform, a different system. There's no. I mean, it's a, at the beginning. What's exciting? I found it's like it's a new world, and you discover, you try things. Things will succeed greatly. Things will fail miserably. But but now it's more like, oh, can can just everyone use the same game sign up platform <laughs> and the same structure and know how Twitch it, works? Variety is getting tiring. Yeah. So yeah. So. So tell us more about what did you say this convention is called? Mm. Oh, uh, the upcoming or the recent? Uh, well, well look, tell us both. I've been lucky on yeah, I've been lucky on that note uh, because I've been uh, my offsider Lee and I at Liberation Industries have been working quite closely in tandem with the people who run ArcanaCon, which is sort of our big Melbourne convention, usually held in January. Uh, we've actually had quite a close handle on how systems of running the conventions work so when we ran game dunk back in uh july i hope it was july the months are getting a little squishy at the moment you'll have they to are, yeah. me that um, but uh but when we run when we ran game dunk we essentially cobbled it together from um you know discord and a few other streaming services so that we could have people in and interacting while also watching seminars and and what have you uh and more recently, we were sort of uh, press gang into us. Uh, we, I, I think there was a volunteering going on, but we, we had to rather rapidly turn around uh, an exhibit for the Melbourne International Game Week because usually they, I think they run that in tandem with PAX Australia. Okay, but, uh, wow. That moved this year. Um, so they, the ArcanaCon crew got them an email and it's like, okay, we have two weeks to prepare an online convention, uh, which we did. And it was great fun um, using very similar systems to what we'd used before. So because we often run only quite um, small numbers in any given room, our Discord has been an absolute godsend and we sort of build systems out from that. Uh, and it looks like we're going to be using a similar thing for the next ArcanaCon come January because uh, though it looks as if we may have a bit more, you know, touch wood, we may have a bit more freedom here uh, at that point. Uh, I, there's no way that we were able to secure sort of physical space booking. So it looks like it's going to be a very online convention once again. 
for those of you who are international, it's a lot easier to tune in this year. But uh, yeah, it, it has its unique suite of challenges. Um, so yeah, I will, you know, I'll be at that. I'll, I will be sort of hosting a follow-up to the game dunk, which was essentially a uh, grand sampling, I guess, of some of the game designs we had come through. Uh, and it's, you know, I love those. I love game jams. I, I, I love the sort of pressure cooker creativity that, and we've got a great crew here in, uh, here in Australia. Uh, nice to see them all tuned in at once. If, if people uh, watching, listening to this uh, are fluent with French, there's a game jam starting just now for CyberConf 2. Uh, it's about travel, le voyage. So if people are looking for a jam in French, uh, whether or not it's your first language, here's your your opportunity to try. So uh, have you been running some of your games as well, or were you there mainly as an organizer, podcaster in those conventions? Yeah, I find myself, I think, uh, often a lot more as the, what's the word? I guess the gamer is entertainer niche. I'm usually running other people's games, and I, I sort of try and bring out the razzle-dazzle. Um, at that, at uh, the Melbourne International Game Week one, I was slated to run a uh, village song by the Story Brewers, which if you have the chance to check it out, absolutely do so. Very interesting sort of, uh, I would say, loosely mythic Indonesian kind of inspired uh, village RPG. Very cool. Um, oh, wow. And a very interesting focus. So. Yeah, like Story Brewers are sort of uh, some of our best known designers, I think. They do they do phenomenal work. But um, yeah, so I was all geared up to run that for a group at the time. And I was chatting on a panel as well, I guess, about the uh, about ways that one can be a better role player, which sort of steps into the, me the meta element of how I do most of my job. Because I think, unfortunately, when you work as a, when you're thinking as an entertainer, thinking about very different priorities than you are as a gamer uh and it is very difficult for me to switch that off a lot of the time i think because most people when they play their games they're just there to have fun with their friends they don't have to worry about an audience that's going to be consuming stuff secondhand uh so i have you know i'm i'm coming very much from that direction when i'm talking about how one games and i do my best to switch that off <laughs> well Yesterday, I was watching a, a panel uh, as part of Acadicon, uh, which included, uh, well, it included Virginia Page from Modifius, at least, uh, who's a, an old friend of uh, mm. our show. But it, because it was about streaming and podcasting actual plays, and they discussed how you need to be an entertainer when you run this type of game. Uh, I've, I've run a, a few, and I think it's quite interesting the way you play for a person who's at the table with you, who's the audience, but unlike most role-playing games, don't have a, a chance really to interact with you, except maybe a little bit uh, showing their approval or disapproval via the, the chat room. But it's, it's an, I really like this dynamic, actually. I find there's an energy among the players and the game master. Uh, in a way, people are much more focused on on moving things forward, you know, <laughs> things don't drag as often because it's about, okay, you need to go on. It's not about respecting uh, the the consistency, uh, so keeping something consistent in the, the logic. It's it's all about moving forward. But the, the thing mm. is, the release podcast, uh, part of the reason I started the podcast was because of an Australian podcast, but not an RPG podcast called uh, The Weekly Planet. Mm. I don't know if you are aware of that one. I know, I know of them, yeah. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to listen to it much, though. Well, it's more general geekiness, commenting on the movies coming out. And at the moment, there's no movie coming out. So it's quite interesting how they, they need to find topics <laughs> to discuss about. How they deal with that, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they go back on yeah picking a subject and, and, and discussing it. Uh, but mm. what... You you are telling me that lately you there there's no nothing hot in terms of game design on your side. What what are you working on, or what did you last release uh, on itch.io? Oh, me specifically. Um, yeah, it's been. Like, I I think it's been an all right time on a design side. Uh, personally, for me, like my most recent ones were uh, I think it was Cry in the Deep because. 
naturally, when you are hosting a game jam, you you tr you do your best to think of the uh, most outlandish prompts that you can feed people. Um, and the the few that I was able to engineer were, you know, things like massive marine mammals, and uh, you know, asymmetrical gaming, and all all sorts of interesting things. So naturally, my brain immediately jumped to it's like, well, I have to show them that this can be done too, you know, for the amateurs who who came to the jam for the first time, for I guess the, the the people who had never experienced this sort of thing before. It's like, I will show them that it can be done and not to fear doing it badly. Uh, <laughs> first, first rule of writing, don't, don't be scared of doing a bad job because you'll never do anything if you are. Um, so yeah, Cry in the Deep was my my space whale drama. Uh, in which a bunch of space whales try and save the the undersea civilization uh, from a collapse, um, and it turned out very strangely, highly ritualistic. And um, I was lucky enough to have uh, Vidicia Valetti have a have a look at it, and he and he said very board gamey. Sorry, that's a very like very board gamey presentation. Uh, so that was my most recent. I think uh, I do tend to create things that are quite. Uh, linked to board gaming. I'm not sure why this is. Uh, I think I just enjoy having a, like a, if not necessarily a physical artifact, but an interactivity with uh, with an artifact that you share between you. With like a... uh, if it's a map or what have you, something that you can manipulate as a group and see the see the world in front of you that you can change. I don't know if it's something which is. Um... Don't like this word, but trendy at the moment, or if it's something I was not aware of before, and now I started noticing. But there are a lot of games, including the one I'm developing, and it was really not planned, which sort of bridge that gap between board game, role playing mm -hmm. game, and story game. Uh, I, the last game I ran in the at the Gauntlet was uh, Sonia, Sonia and Conan versus the Ninja. Uh, you use you use mm -hmm. cards that you fill. I've been hearing a lot, but I haven't played for the Queen. It's very popular, and uh, there's a lot of interesting hacks. Uh, mm. My game, Paris Gondo, also use cards like that. Uh, you got stuff like mm. Dino Island, in which you you use a map. It's I, I like Even I like this gap, snap, this yeah. kind of snappy, quick to play games. I, I guess I guess the having handouts, things you manipulate. Uh, it's less stuff it helps people having to care less about the rules because when you have an element in hand it's not as difficult as remembering a sentence from a guidebook you you follow the sequence of the card or, or mm. the step-by-step -step thing you which you have uh, on your table it's the mo yeah just the element of having those instructions in front of you is like hugely valuable uh and you know it's the i guess it's almost powered by the apocalypticism you know just having that fact sheet just like anyone can read it it's right there at any time i think that absolutely does help maintain a i guess a, an easier collective thought space at the uh at the table where you don't have to be flipping through books i was you know I, I, was, I was lucky i was able to talk about this a little when we were doing the panel and it's like we're not we're, we're in such a strange place culturally aren't we because not only as as role players are we sort of simultaneously audience and performer uh, but we're also sort of in this space between improvised theater and board games. And we have like this, yeah, it's like sort of towing the line between those things is so intriguing. I mean, I've been chatting to it with, with some friends lately too. The idea, I, I think a lot of, you know, just a lot of the games I've been reading lately have been focused, I guess, on encouraging good behavior. But a, a lot of my friends sort of say, it's like, oh, that's good. But I need to feel constrained as well mm. because otherwise the world is limitless and you end up at that bad end of improvised theater where like you're just yes ending everything and things go completely wild <laughs> so i think the board gaminess almost gives you that lattice that skeleton of a world uh that is you know so useful to give people a sense of where they stand and what is not just possible but also what is impossible because that is that is where you find drama yeah, I, I, I always say that it's because of my training as an architect. But mm. uh, I like constraints. I, I like having mm. something to help me frame my creativity. So I, I clearly understand the, the the idea of a jam. You have a, a shared topic. Uh, I, 
for the little story, I don't know if I already told that on the podcast, but when my wife uh, and, and me, we got together, uh, when I was an architect, and she, she asked me, could you draw me a house? She, she thought it would be fun that I draw her house. And I answered her, no, no, I actually can't because you're giving me a blank sheet. I, I would need a, a site. Mm. I would need a budget. Need direction. Yeah, uh, give me a basis. Yeah. And then I look at all of that. I know where the sun is. I know if there's a slope. I know where the street is. What's the need? What's your budget? So that gives a, a kind of a limitation. And all of that helped mm. me define what's uh, the house. Uh, and while developing the house, I need to interact with the clients or the people involved, the stakeholders. And, and that thing evolves to become something which is a house or a neighborhood nowadays. Mm. Uh, because I'm more of an urban designer, but so when when I'm confronted with free form role playing, sometimes it's it's kind of freezing me because if you give me too mm. much freedom, I'm like I don't know, I don't know, uh, or or also I, I like when it gets board gamey and really structured. And this year I played Belonging, mm. uh, a hero's journey. I think it's the full title, and it's really structured. I don't know that one. Yeah, it's really structured mm. in. Uh, act phases and i really like that and the players have specific roles because if it's three form or uh even pbt have got issues with them sometimes uh it's not a judgment of mm -hmm. their quality it's just my personal ways what i prefer but if we are on the same level and we're all supposed to do the same thing all the players i immediately feel like i'm i'm in a design committee <laughs> and, and and I'm like <laughs> I, I'm like okay. That's an interesting comment. Yeah. Either I I I go soft and I don't push for my ideas and I'm a bit frustrated with that, mm. or I push my ideas and I feel a bit like I'm bullying people into my ideas. I, sort of yeah. It's very difficult. Mm. It, it Making too much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm overthinking it all the time and it it, it impairs my experience. But if you tell me okay, this mm. is the first act, give me. A location, I can give you a location and then player two, like in Sonya mm -hmm. and Conan, give me a character and the third person give me a, a plot now. Uh, suddenly things are structured. It's very clear. We have all our little contained box. We still interact with one another, but and we still listen to one mm -hmm. another, but we have defined role and we know how far we can go mm -hmm. without uh, reading that role. Yeah, I think... I, I suppose uh, because I, I come at it from the opposite direction because both at Liberation Industries, both Lee and I have some background in improvised theater. Uh, we have those emergency protocols so that you don't freeze, uh, you know, because the worst thing you can have either on stage or on radio is dead air. And you don't <laughs> want that. Like you cannot freeze in the headlight. But when designing games, I have to remember that not everyone has that. Like you actually do have to train that reflex in. And I, I've had I've had people say the same thing about I guess the culture around powered by the apocalypse games that always asking questions and you know like asking those leading questions to help players make the world. Some people love that they love feeling like they you know like they're contributing, but I think it does take a gentle hand because some people like they you know it feels like an interrogation. It's like oh why do I have to why do I have to build this bit? Can't you build this bit? Uh, <laughs> Or maybe maybe we just need to share that move of uh, turn the turn the question around on them. You know that can be a player move as well. It's like we if back. the MC asks you a question, just what do you think it is? <laughs> yeah, I also maybe I don't that's know. a healthier way to deal with it. So I had that also with um, for for a while. A group I played a lot with here in London was a, a club of French speaking French French speaking role players, and. All of us were game masters on a table and through rotation and different tables, you would end up with a, a table. I would be the game master, but all the players were game masters at other tables, including some that's, where I was that's a, curse. a player. I know that curse. But you know, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not the curse that I expected, which would be, oh, they all want to mm. game master my game. I had the opposite mm. curse because at the time, so all of that, the culture there was very traditional gaming the game master t mm. brings something and the players react to that and i was listening to mm. all these podcasts about powered by the apocalypse and new ways of doing role-playing games and i was oh, i really want to try that and when i tried it the reaction was really no 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 
tonight I'm the player, I'm the game master. I, I don't want to make up the story. I'm here to <laughs> to be a player, yeah. to, to be the gamer in the video game you made. I'm not here to create assets or uh, a set or a mm -hmm. game design, a game level of that video game. I'm here and... to play Mario, not to say how many Goombas are coming, uh, are coming at me. And, it, it, and I, at, at first I was really like, whoa, what, what, what is going on? And since then I've been mm -hmm. playing a lot of storytelling shared things and I've realized I like it at small doses and with very mm -hmm. vibrant and specific setting. Like I really like Passion de la Passiones. But mm. mo some games, especially if it's contemporary occult, if I play them, I, I keep trying to go to the character layer to to be my character, mm. and I'm and I keep being interrupted by questions about the, where the story is going yeah. and uh, what is going on. And you, create. Have, you have to think outside the character. That yeah. it, I think it's so much a part of your own social contract, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. the difference between like these aren't these are completely different experiences. They're not just different brands of the same thing. They're completely different uh, modes of interaction. Aren't it's like they? playing squash or tennis. Um, it looks the same, but not quite the same. Mm. Well, yeah, from from my own experiences, like because I'm I'm perpetual GM as well most of the time, uh, and it's been noted that when I do get to play a character, they're usually incredibly they seem to have death wishes, uh, like <laughs> very poor impulse control, because I'm so used to having NPCs just go after what they want, because that's how, act, you know, it's like in a pinch, have a man kick in the door with a gun. Uh, <laughs> it's like, think about the consequences later. Um, so when I, when I play as, as, a, as a, a player, I, I'm sort of thinking in the same way. It's like, well, let's see how much drama I create before I inevitably crash and burn. Um, and I think, I think you do need to sort of negotiate that with your players, don't you? Because it's like how much of a not a, not only how much of a I guess a, a, a collaborative generation is not just uh, not just fun, but also vital. And how much of it is necessary? How much of a burden do you need to be carrying? Can we just show up and say it's like yeah, okay? Can we just inhabit our characters? Or do we need to think of them like a playing piece, like a, a character that we're writing rather than a character that we're being? Uh, and it's I, it, the experiences are so separate. Uh, and the trouble is, I don't think we yet have the, uh, I guess, the different genres to really, well, I mean, we have them, but it, it's so hard to communicate when you just say, hey, who's coming over for games night? Yeah, the, I think that there's been a lot of discourse of, I think we, we're about to move beyond maybe a sort of a pendulum uh, situation mm. where the pendulum of the game masters got all the control, that which was the old way. Mm. And then we pushed the pendulum in the other direction, which was, no, we should be sharing power and decide things together. And at this point, it feels more like, well, actually, you have at least two, if not many more schools of ways of doing mm. things like you're cooking, you got Chinese food, you got Italian food, you got French food. <laughs> so instead of arguing about this one using too much spice or this one uh, mm. using too much butter, we should realize that, oh, wait a minute, we've got different schools. So it's about fine tuning, understanding what really mm. works with each school and helping people identify mm. what school they want to play when, because it doesn't, yeah. Also mean that you're gonna eat French every night because it's your favorite thing. You you get <laughs> sick of it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so now yeah. when when I'm trying to join the ga some game, um, I I find it we're lacking the vocabulary for me to have a, a, an open conversation with the game master for them to put in their little description. I'm this type of game mm -hmm. master. I'm offering this type of experience because what I realized also is that you have a lot of systems. If the game master's got one philosophy and the system is another, uh, it can still work. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. a, a car crash. I think you can run PBTA still very curated by the game master and mm -hmm. uh, the PBTA yeah. system is mainly there to resolve different situations. But the, the wider story, you don't need to go full on dungeon world, blank map, making up everything as, as you go. Mm. And I seen systems which, if I just read them, I would have run them 
traditional style, very curated, and I ran with game master who were really okay. Leading question, leading question, leading question, which which I loved for some session. I didn't like so much for others, and I could see other players enjoy that. So again, it's not a judgment of quality, but I was like, ooh, this game master, I, I really like him and respect the what the experience he curates, but I know that there are certain things, like I would not enjoy playing, I don't know, Vampire the Masquerade with that game master because that's not what mm. I'm seeking with that type of of setting or or, or Call of Tulu, uh, that not that's not mm -hmm. what I, I'd be after. But again, that doesn't mean the game master is bad uh, at all. I think he's very excellent. But he's excellent at mm. I don't know Chinese food. Why why I prefer I prefer French. In the real world, I do like Chinese food and French uh, equally. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this is purely for a point yeah, of illustration. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like. Do not, do not, uh, do not uh, refuse to ask Callum out for Chinese food. Australian though. food, I haven't, I haven't <laughs> tried yet, so I don't know. It's it, uh, <laughs> it, it's a questionable fusion at best. Uh, <laughs> it's like usually, yeah, usually we we go out for Chinese too. Don't worry. Um, yeah, like, and I think I don't know that it's that we don't have the vocabulary. I think it's it's coming. But, you know, we're, I think we're still a relatively new culture and a very internationalist one. Yes. I mean, you were, were you on the panel about um, uh, sort of non-English speaking, non-English speaking in the RPGs? Yeah, yeah that, that was yours, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I was just, try, I was just trying no, to find fine. a segue. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about that and it's like, okay, how do we get a common vocabulary across languages? Uh, because we are now an internationalist culture, because I think in each of our countries, uh, as a proportion of the population generally, the role-playing community is always going to be quite small. Uh, and I see it in Australia especially, we are aggressively internationalist because we have that internet connection and most of our cultural touchstones come from either Europe or the USA. Uh, we're getting infiltrations uh that's a bad word to use uh we're getting like a an influence now cross from, poly uh, cross pollinization it's called yes cross pollination uh for particularly from southeast asia recently with some of the i guess powerhouse uh creators out of the philippines and malaysia uh but that's that's you know like that's something we notice that's something that people who are sort of tuned into that notice but it hasn't really hit the mainstream yet um so i think we are beginning to develop, like we've got this huge communication network, but we lack a language to talk to each other, which is intriguing and terrifying in its own way. You're making me want to make my French better because I I feel like whenever you talk, whenever you and Jason or whatever talk, I feel so left out. I feel like, wow, there's this entire world of RPGs that I cannot access. I could, I could maybe read them, but I cannot talk to you. To be it's like... To be honest, after, even when you do have the language, then you run into the situation of uh, time and just general availability. Mm. Because I, I don't engage very much, if at all, with the, the French scene. Uh, I played mm. a game today with some French uh, podcasters. I was very happy uh, to have an opportunity to do that. We've got this online convention coming, a uh, French online convention, which has been a huge opportunity, even just within France, for people to engage with one another. But beyond that, I don't engage that much with the community. And actually, mm. I was discussing uh, on Twitter recently with someone who was, she was saying that she was, although she was, her first language was French, she was unwilling to engage with the French community because their culture, uh, it's a bit hard to say they are backward. They, they're a bit beyond, they 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 don't have the philosophies of pronouns to, to to illustrate that they don't have the pronouns they they don't have the safety practices are still a hot topic for a lot of people mm. because you were talking different countries we are also a multi generational community right. so we we're starting yeah. to get Gen Z coming in uh, I guess I guess the the kind of stuff we were discussing it's kind of Gen X but then we we got boomers who are role playing and they they got their views their vocabulary which we didn't have the time to adopt I, I think what makes it difficult nowadays to develop a co a shared vocabulary is that 
it's great to have this platform where we can all share ideas but we don't have the i, I guess something like music or cinema mm. in french there in france they had the cahier de cinema in the us they had uh what's his name ebert and you know you, you had sort of mainstream uh icon staple house references which everybody would learn from and mm -hmm. study they might be wrong mm -hmm. it might have been uh, somewhat dictatorial that you had a few individuals in control of the discourse and the vocabulary mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to develop a vocabulary without central figures or organizations i guess that's why and i i never was involved with them that that's why a lot of vocabulary came from the forge because it was kind of a mm. self-contained tight community which developed this vocabulary and now yeah. we, we took it uh, with all the issues they had or might not have had. Uh, mm. I'm not aware of that. But, but they, were, you... they were prolific, if nothing else. I mean, like, they, they really did try and hammer it into a shape. They, you know, like, for, for whatever else you, you say about them, they did actually codify a lot of this stuff. And, I mean, even if the terms are no longer the terms we want to use, like, having those reference points is vital. I mean, I think, I, I just realized, I think the strangest thing is that really, like, we have this multi-generational system, each having their own language for dealing with it, but almost like the entire lineage is still alive, and most of them are on Twitter. Yes. How did I only just realize this? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that, that's true, you're right also, because we're talking of music. Uh, the people mm. who know that, I don't know, rock and roll was made by uh, mm. people of color, by black people, they... I'm not saying they're all dead, but first of all, they, most of them are not on Twitter and they've sort of been mm. uh, hidden behind the history of white rock and roll, the Elvis Presley mm. and so on, which is completely dated for most people. Now. You know, mm. you had sequences of everything, but right now with Roping Game, yeah. everybody's still pretty much around. I mean, maybe mm. Gygax and a few people are, are not alive with us uh, anymore, mm. but you still have the people who played the very we were there the day the first Dungeons and Dragons came out and and, you... yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's such a like a such a strange thing too that uh and this may this may be part of what preventing us forming like I guess a cohesive kind of language to talk about this is I feel like game design in particular outside of the mainstream which the vast majority of people is just Dungeons and Dragons so you could argue sort of chaosium and such are in there as well um so much of our design i think is a product of the internet age where we have like that really rapid turnover and really rapid exchange of ideas you know connections made and lost that may not be renewed ever again uh i think that's like just the speed at which we are discussing things and changing things and just the like the way that our um i guess uh Term, I guess terms of engagement shift so rapidly with you know particularly in a in a field you know with so many of us on Twitter in a field as unstable as Twitter is those little sound bites that travel around and around and then disappear it's like, the, it's like how are we supposed to communicate like this this feels like a machine designed to union buster a system it's like we, we will never be able to talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, me, that's me being very negative. I like Twitter. I met you through Twitter. I, like, we've done good work there, but it is a, it's a rapid world that I don't know if we're well suited to. And it's very splintered also because right now, mm. you know, we were talking about the Forge. And again, I'm not, I'm really not aware of the history of the Forge. I, I heard mm. it secondhand, but it really feels pretty much like something from the age of the forum and the blog. Mm. And these the things, board, yeah. these things are sort of stable, you know, in terms of you, you write a long text, you share it, and people comment and you regurgitate ideas. While right now we're in mm. an age, I think we're even moving past Twitter because we are in an age of, I mean, it's called like that Discord. And what really mm. annoys me with Discord is that I got all those Discords because I try to engage with many communities, and mm. it's too fast for me and it's it's really splintered you've got all those mm. communities separated from one another and it's very difficult even when you're invited to have a holistic view of what's being discussed by everyone which at least mm. twitter sort of of give you so 
So yeah. can we have... Well, it's we... certainly, certainly blast you with a lot of input, yeah. Could we have a, a, <laughs> a, something akin to the Forge again today? Uh, I'm not sure we could because mm. keeping a forum alive and I'm not a blogger, someone who reads a lot of blogs, but I don't feel like this scene is as much alive as it was at the beginning mm. of the, the internet or 10 years ago. I mean, I think it's moving in wild different directions. I think Discord uh, is a very useful tool, but it is something that requires a degree of cultivation. I think we're seeing a lot of mini forges spring up uh, in like relatively insular Discord communities. If you look at, um, uh, you know, like the Blades in the Dark design chat, or even someone like Erica Chappell, who has her own little cluster and play testers, just, you know, like doing designs on Discord and bouncing that off different people. I think that spirit is still absolutely there. And I think a lot of, um, Indie gaming, I guess, is produced by those splinter groups who have formed a cluster on, on Twitter or in Discord or whatever medium they're using. And I think that ultimately is what you need to do. I don't think, you know, I don't think we have the big forums uh, so much as a cultural feature anymore, but people have been forced to make their own with the sort of collapse of Google Plus and that. I think people realize that as like, well, if we're going to test these, we actually need to actively create the group. Now, a lot of those groups are quite cross-cultural. Um, a lot of them are, you know, like very wide ranging. But um, I think the very point, they are relatively small, essentially. They are a group of people who are, if not known quantities, at least at least they all recognize each other and they can talk this stuff out in a, in a, fa in a fairly safe environment. I think it's there. Mm. I think, unfortunately, it's not like, Blasted over the internet in the way that a bulletin board service would be. It's these little hidden pockets. And if you get invited into one, great. They're really interesting. Um, but to, to try and, uh, what's the word? To try and sort of socially socialize yourself within one of them too, you run into a lot of the same problem. They will have their own language. They'll have their own vocabulary. And you're going to have to run extra fast to keep up. Just like the old Forge did. It was, the joke I get, I've heard is that, you know, you had to read five essays to understand any of what people are saying. Um, and, and it's almost a bit like that, except it's it's the the, um, the slang of the panther moderns from Neuromancer. It's like this, this apparently different language that people are speaking. Even if it is an English-speaking group for me, it's like, oh, wow, you all... You all have evolved in here, haven't you? <laughs> so when it's sort the of the trouble is I'm the same. It, it's it's sort of become. I guess people like to find their families. I mean, I like being in mm. on private jokes. I like private jokes and and having just enough knowledge to get private jokes. Uh, mm. But I, you look at something like TikTok. It's pretty much like that. Also, uh, I joined it. Mm. I don't know a year ago now, and. The first two weeks first, I felt really old, <laughs> really, really old. And, and lost. And, lo and lost. Like, and you know, it's like, what is this? Why? 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 <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks of, of, you know, watching videos, you start getting it. You know, the cyclic mm. nature of it and the inside jokes, the, the memes and so mm. on. But it's part of the enjoyment because then when you, I run into, let's say, Senda from uh, She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Podcast and Panda's Talking Game, mm. who are, is one of the few tabletop RPG fans who's not a D strictly a D&D &D fan or a critter, who's there on, on mm. TikTok. I know we can share references on Twitter and we understand one another. Mm. And, and you're like, yeah, I'm part of a club. I, I guess people, you know, with... The nuclear family, all of that, the, the political affiliation, it's become difficult. So we're all looking for for framework, for references, for, for families. And and mm. why it takes time to get in one of those families once you're there, at least it, that's a little comfort you get from them. I think that's a deep human thing. I think, like our, our, I believe personally that our brains work best in that, you know, small community of, of relatively known quantities. Uh, and I think, you know, for that reason, a lot of really good work happens in them. Uh, 
admittedly, you, you talk about TikTok this way, but my, you know, like a lot of my friends and my wife will say, it's like, it's like, how do you, how do you live on Twitter? Like, how does this make any sense? Because it's the same, like in its own way, it's those little flying sound bites of information. And if you're not used to passing them, the sort of, you know, like grappling out the meaning that you need from them, it, it's chaos. Uh, which is, you know, like it has its uses once again, but I don't know if it really, I don't know if it's really conducive to uh, like, I guess the latter stages of design. It's, it, I found it really useful to like snap and generate an idea. Like it's great prompts, but uh, I think really gets to the nitty gritty of something to really build something solid. You need that honest feedback and like a, a honest feedback from a deep interaction which is uh, something you only get from someone you, to a certain extent, that you trust. Yeah, you need, That's to, what I think anyway. you need, you need to slow down and uh, at the end of the day, actually play the game. I mean, uh, hmm. with the game I'm designing, that's where, uh, which was really a new experience for me to have this game I designed and offer it to people, see them play it and see how they, they behaved uh, with it. Uh, I don't think any level of... Hmm tweeting or even blogging regarding uh, what it was or what I was trying to do would would have helped uh, so much. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of roping game. You you engage on a very specific level when you 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 play a role playing game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, just the I mean, just the ritual of like, it, it, it is, I guess, like a um, it is a ritual. It's you know, it's a group of people who gather together and they all pretend to be someone else for a little while, but then we all come back to who we are. In a funny way, it's a kind of exorcism, I guess. But, but um, <laughs> it is a deeply human thing, and it's like it's it's amazing how important that kind of storytelling is to us, and it's proven really important in this um, like very trying time. It's like, well, how do we connect? It's like, well, we'll all go and play role playing games on Discord. Um, at least we can talk. At least we can pretend to be other uh, other, other people from a distance. It's funny we started talking about oh, uh, there's a, a growing number maybe of role playing game story game which are getting board gamey with a lot of assets mm. you share on it. And now we got the image of the the invention of religion. So yeah, so, so you you sit here and you just engage with God through prayer. Okay, uh, can I make a special move when I do that? Uh, sure, mm -hmm. why you you do that or you you do this? Okay, I mean, okay, can, okay. Could we have? A... We, yeah, we gather at a table. We cast lots. We read. We read oracles. How is this not religious? <laughs> can we? So much but... of this is religious paraphernalia. But but yeah, the, but that's <laughs> the thing. The prayer of saying, okay, that's great. But could we have a, a little special biscuit and can I have a big candle? Oh yeah. yeah okay. Can the cloth <laughs> on the table be special? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are with role-playing games. We, we're starting to develop the Eucharisty and all this kind of paraphernalia for, for things. Who says religion can't be fun? <laughs> well, we, we see all things will evolve. Uh, coming back on the idea of developing vocabulary and theories, uh, it was coming to me that also the comparison with video games uh, mm. because... I imagine my, my brother works in video game, so but the the vocabulary of video games you, you sort of have two groups. You got the players, they got their vocabulary to define what video games are, and then you got the theory of making video games which is sort of limited to the designers of video game, a professional mm. body, which is a limited number of people. They meet in schools, they meet in seminars, and they say, okay, this is level design. This is called a asset box. This is called a structure. This is called this sort of things. And you need to configure your, you think of your curve of progression. This is a puzzle game. Mm. This is for a casual audience. This is for, for this type of audience. But yeah. the vocabulary- And on top of that, you also have the, the marketing people who have to take these products and put them into a box so that they can reach that consumer, which so, is another culture entirely. <laughs> yeah, and uh, on one hand, they, they got more resources. There are more of them than there mm. are designers of role-playing games. But at mm. the same time, it's quite self-contained and they, they, they're not influenced mm. by the player as much as you would think in terms of yeah. defining the theory of video game. 
why it feels like tabletop roping games because it's so it engages so much the game master the player that mm. you cannot really talk theory of role playing games without talking about what the game master is going to do and and game masters mm. are almost everyone within on the internet because players are mm. not there as much i think or they don't listen to podcasts as much so so it's yeah. even more difficult because you got your whole audience and suddenly you need to define things with everyone involved not just not just a few designers talking between one another mm. uh but all all the game master will have an opinion about what you you're saying or not mm. absolutely and i think like something we notice in in, in both uh like video game and role playing game i don't hasten to use the term fandom but you know like i guess the groups that consume them is uh like we have this not necessarily a cult of ego, but the sense that, uh, you know, like so much of, of people's worth, I guess, is tied to their work. And, you know, like, the, like it, it, there's a toxicity in a lot of the, the uh, interactions there, which is, is very unfortunate. And I think it does hobble our capacity to critique because, uh, you know, when a creator is used to having sledges, you know, having negativity thrown at them by people who actively want to hurt them, uh, if you're... If, if you are trying to parcel up negativity to help them improve, it can still feel like an attack. Definitely, yeah. Uh, so yeah, both, both, you know, like uh, both, I think, of our, our design communities are often on a bit of a war footing, uh, which I don't think is, is great for, you know, that vocabulary, for criticism generally. And um, if you want to dig really deep into this, uh, Sid Icarus, uh, an Australian um, designer, they are fantastic. Um, I, I've got a, like one of their seminars on the Game Dunk videos on YouTube. Uh, I can send you a link for that if it helps. But um, yeah, like they've been exploring uh, like ways in which we can actually develop this vocab, sort of a critical vocabulary, so we can get some of that healthy relationship. Uh, but you know, yes, I receive criticism, and it will help me make a better game next time. But unfortunately. As things currently stand, we're in this terribly fraught environment, I feel. Uh, and, you know, I, I am a small enough fish, I think, that, uh, you know, I haven't really been flamed. You know, I've, I've snuck under the radar on that one. But, um, and obviously, yeah, it's a, a privileged person as well. But, um, yeah, it's such a, it's a, it's an interesting factor to have to consider because when we look at the relationship between theatre makers and theatre critics, it's an old enough relationship that it feels natural. Yeah. Even if they do hate each other, it does feel normal. Um, it's whereas, codi you know, it's like codified the... and there's a long-standing culture mm. of what, what mm. is going on. It's sort of stable. It's not moving yeah. all over the place all the time. Whereas, you know, our own circles outside of the mainstream, you know, indie designers uh, and critics, they're both presumably non-professionals. Because who's making money in this industry? I don't know. It's like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like, so e each one of these people is obviously they have other things to do with their lives, but it is they're trying to build something without having that long standing relate like that long standing relationship. It's a big world, Callum. <laughs> <laughs> like we are in this big terrifying world and it is almost utterly unprecedented and it's, it's very uh, young and we, want, we want these structures but we don't we don't know how to make them everyone forgot how to make them <laughs> yeah because this you know there's this paradox again it's, it's a bit what i was saying earlier that it's it's very difficult to get some things not in a collaborative fashion uh mm. and and at the same time concentrating powers in some ends is something negative but sometimes mm. i wonder to what extent now we're at a stage of the number of fields and situation on which we build on the shoulders of people who are not great uh and they did things mm. a, a bad way but uh yeah i'm mm. I, i'm not um I don't like when anarchy is described these crazy things where everybody goes wild. That's that's not the that's yeah. not the what it's anarchy is supposed to work. No, it's not it's not what <laughs> anarchy is supposed to be. But 
of as someone who organized some events, uh, small ones, mm -hmm. not even large ones, uh, and worked also in a in a creative industry, I I'm I'm think I think I'm for uh, collective oversight, but not collective mm -hmm. leadership, and there are two different things, and it's. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to to agree or have situation on which we we agree that a limited group of people is sort of developing something which is not perfect, but that's this base that we share and mm. we can build upon different things now, because mm -hmm. starting by running everybody in in different different direction, that's uh that's very that's just very difficult. That's just dif difficult to do. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I suppose a challenge in that is in this interconnected, globalized world is where, where do we draw those lines? It's like, you know, I think it takes an act of, of will and, and dedication to create the communities that can carry an idea from inception because chaos is great for inception. Chaos jogs your mind beautifully. And I mean, you know, it's back, back when I ran it, when I was living in Canberra, Australia's little known capital, um, I, I, I ran a comedy group and our deal was always, we would be in the nice laid back anarchic, uh, you know, chaotic creation stage until two weeks before a show, at which point I was going to be the utterly <laughs> authoritarian, uh, and we would get that show made. It didn't matter if it was perfect, we would get it done. Um, because I think in any creation to really bring it out its best you've got that inception but you've also got a refinement stage and then a, and then you know like a, a i guess a post life the interaction with the audience so you need those latter two stages in a more structured environment i think we just need to decide where our communities sit uh, and it's a, a, and like you have so many options now i, I guess choice paralysis is is a, a big problem you really do need to put in the work to get these communities to exist yeah, that's. I guess that's where the the appeal of D and D is. Uh, it's it's mm. clear. It's clear. It's yeah. got an infrastructure. It's got a community. So mm. people who are onboarding on role playing games, that's that's an easy point for them to, hopefully, mm. start with or so often end up, uh, mm. <laughs> rather than. Oh, you should try role playing games. Oh, okay. I have no clue what it is. What should I do? Well, wait a minute. Are you more a reactive player or are you more a sh shared storytelling player? Because there's this game master over there. Or you want to be a PBTA? Or maybe not. Maybe you what you want to try is this thing, and it's just it's just confusing. Uh, you, you need yeah, we, you need to take someone. We need to or... take someone's horoscope before uh, <laughs> before we can let them play. <laughs> so I guess that's where we come back to board gamey story games. It's uh, mm -hmm. you got those assets. You got those cards you point at them you say look this card over there it shows a green dragon that means we need to have a green dragon in the in our story and the person says, oh, okay all right that's a starting point for me rather than you can make up anything <laughs> tell, me, tell me what's happening new player anything you want some people do it some people do it but mm. <laughs> not all yeah, and I think, you know, we, we were talking about that balance between creativity and constraint, and people absolutely get different things out of it. I think one thing I love uh, is, I guess, uh, you sort of pick up and play party games. Uh, I, I love um, Damn the Man, Save the Music from Make Big Things uh, for that. It is, you've got, you've got that with you? <laughs> That's that's my yeah. lesson in uh, if it's got dice and it's in a box, it's taxed as a game. So remember that Kickstarter <laughs> campaigner so I don't have to pay a yeah. tax on top of the price because it's stuck at the border mm. and I receive an ultimatum yeah. telling me <laughs> oh, no. we're going to trash it if you don't pay us 50 oh. extra pounds. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I paid, well, yeah, okay. I don't know, 70 pounds on top of the price. That's 70 pounds, which didn't go to the designers of this yeah. game. Mm. Anyway, you sorry. know, so, so send, in, send in that wish out into the world. You know, living where I do, I'm used to having to pay an extra hundred or so dollars to get anything delivered. So, you know, that's, that's always fun. Um, <laughs> what can you do? Uh, but yeah, I, I love these pick up and play party games essentially because in the way that you would have like a, I guess a murder mystery dinner 
or what have you. It's like, yeah, you can break out these games. They're low pressure. They're fun. And they and then the man saves the save the music has a very accessible touchstone. A lot of this generation have seen, if not necessarily Empire Records, they've seen something in that milieu. Well, um, that's interesting because this game I played once because I don't have anyone around me who shared the references. So I was like, yeah, all oh, right, well, no. Clerks, Empire <laughs> Record, I can play that. And then I go around, and I'm like, okay, my wife, no, she doesn't like music this way. Uh, mm. I'm like, I don't know anyone in my area to play yeah. Damn the Man Save the Music. Well, I mean, yeah, but... Uh... But it's niche, so... When you found mm. people, you you gather around yeah. those notions and you 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 go forward. I guess I guess it comes back to your pitch again, like you know, like it, 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 the Empire Records is the big one. It's real, like it, it is really a rent punk game. Like it is real, like it's really a game about drop kicks trying to save their favorite place. And you know, if people have seen Fern Gully, that's that, you can play it the same way, you know, if, or, or something like that. Um, and I think. By way of example, uh, you know, when, because, like, so many murder mysteries, like, the murder mystery parties will hew towards either basically really worn-out noir tropes or, like, a, a bad Christmas theme, usually. Uh, you know, like, you're, you're usually getting, like, either either noir, Poirot, or, or some sort of really strange Christmas story. And I think having, like, I guess an explicit uh, touchstone there really helps a great deal because you know to an extent something like damn the man it's simple it's easy you're like and you can do it in that short amount of time doesn't require campaign length it means you can basically break it out as an option for people who aren't necessarily role players and they can absolutely you know ducks to water they can jump in on that um <clears throat> i suppose some people would take a bit more coaching than others but i think those sorts of games they're going to be what changes the culture in mm. in my mind you know they're, they're going to be what uh shows the world i guess that this isn't necessarily just dungeons and dragons that we have these you know fun little games as well that you can just pick up and play and you know you don't need to teach it so much you just it's it's some fun with friends yeah i think we can there could be some uh groundbreakers in terms of wider audience like mm. like what Settler, settlers of Catan did to board games, to mm. strategy board games. It became a new reference and maybe it's not as popular as something like Monopoly, but it definitely opened the field mm. very widely compared to what were board games when I was a kid, which was MB, Ravensburger, it was a game of life or the, mm. the billionaire game and maybe Atmosphere. But then we've got Settlers of mm. Catan and it opened a lot of people to yeah. Euro games and then other types of games. I think... We already had for quite a few years now, if not a couple of decades, uh, Werewolf, which is the sort of game you can mm. play with, with everyone. Uh, we could have... Werewolf's a great example, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they're really there. They're almost... Yeah, you know, they, they're pretty much story games. They're, they're pretty much role-playing mm. games. Uh, but yeah. we could have more of them, maybe some which are even more on, on our side and see how they go. I mean, we had the... Uh, we had the Peter Petrusha from uh, Rest in Peace, which is a Jenga tower game in the vein of uh, Billy and Mandy or Rick and Morty, where you play a bunch of housemates and one of the housemates is death, uh, you know, on those cartoony tropes, and you got the Jenga tower. <laughs> These are the sort of games mm. which you could really get for lack of a better term, casual players to to mm. get a bit more on board with role playing game, and then then you bring them to damn the man, then you bring them to passion de la passionesse, mm. and you're on the spectrum, and then yeah. they they drift wherever on that spectrum they feel the most comfortable. Mm. Yeah. And then because they... yeah, it's go on. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, and then they will buy a cry in the deep uh, on itch. <laughs> maybe they will Callum maybe they will I'm sure they will <laughs> eventually, eventually folks will find their gateway drug to my space whales don't you worry <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess the other side of it and I recognize we're probably getting towards the end of our window but I guess the other side of it is we so much of our creations are, are a sort of folk art as well 
I think there's a great many people out there who are creating these games, not necessarily with the idea that anyone will ever consume them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just as as an artistic outlet, you know, it's which is fine. I Definitely, mean, it's, yeah. it's a medium of art. Like like you people but, um, draw maps or they engage in yeah. crafts. It's a uh, it's before anything. It's a uh, it's a personal endeavor. I mean, like you what some like people. I I assume most people who write poetry. Do we do it mm. mainly for their own sake rather than I'm going to do this poem and then everybody going to mm. share it on Instagram? <laughs> yeah, we can't we can't all, we can't all be the big fish on social media, can we? It's just, everybody's uh... going to share my poem with the sunset in uh, behind it, and all the <laughs> the mothers <laughs> going to share it on Facebook as an inspiration quote. Revolutionary. Um... It's like yeah, but they'll they'll share it, but it'll be deep faked, and they'll claim that Karl Marx said it, uh, and there'll be a picture of Karl Marx next to it. Well, the it's always is weird. It's always Einstein. <laughs> it's not the Karl Marx that often. It's most of the time it's Einstein, yeah. uh, Churchill, or Mark Twain. Dalai Lama. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's uh. Mm. <laughs> that's a yeah, good, I think that's a good topic for a jam. I think like fake quotation game. Uh... Fake quotation jam. <laughs> I'm I'm here for that. We get that we get that going on itch. That'll be that'll be a bit of fun. Um. Yeah, I don't. And I look. I don't. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think people um. What's the word? You know, like. The, the eternal debate and it's you well i mean i not I, the eternal tension and it's used to shut down a lot of debate in video gaming is like are games a toy or are they art and they're both they can be both like you know our, our own games are, are they are they amazing exper experiences that'll take you to a brand new place or are they something goofy to have fun with it's, it's both it, it can always be both because we're people we're complicated <laughs> yeah and you got it with all the I fields of, of arts i mean yeah. again i'm an architect you know architecture with a big a when you're a student mm. it's all about architecture with a big a in which nobody lives <laughs> uh, so so then you you enter either you you go the way of trying to become this big architect with an a or work for one of them or you go the way of saying mm. well what matters to me is where people live and i want to do things for yeah. For for the folks, so yeah, cinema is the same. Is it entertainment mm. or is it art? Well, I like stuff mm. which bridges the two, which is sort of smart yet yeah. still enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you, you, I think we run into the, this situation with all media. It's like you, you often, I guess, you'll often run across. You have that moment when you see a film. And it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and sort of see what they were going for, but wasn't for me. Uh, and, you know, maybe, in honesty, that director just made that film for themselves. And sure, some people will probably love it, but it, it, it's not going to be a blockbuster. Um, and that's fine. And I think... I don't know if we can shape, shape our culture. I think it's just so young at the moment. But, uh, like, in, in maybe 30 years' time, if the internet still works, they'll probably pick, like, 2% of what happened and say, oh, yeah, this is what happened in the 2010s. This is it. This is like, you know, it's like, it's like those five songs that people used to sort of summarize the 80s. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's an 80s sound. It's like, there's so much more going on. It was crazy. Things are still crazy. It's never going to stop being crazy. I wonder if we will oh, have okay, that. Bad, with, bad wording necessarily. But with yeah. music. That's, Wildly energetic. That, that's something I find <laughs> also very, com well, not confusing, but a state of the music. There's so much going mm. on. You got access to everything, present mm. and past. Uh, that it's very difficult to say, oh, this is the thing. This is the sounds of the 2020s. Because you, you've got... I mean, I'd like to watch a, a show called Todd mm. in the Shadows, uh, in which he covers mm. hits and past hits. And contemporary uh, sh music, which is charting, it doesn't feel like it's shared by the wider audience. It feels more like the audience is splintered between different tastes, mm. which is great on one hand. And the other hand, we don't have this thing in common as much, or maybe I, I just don't know it because I'm too old. Uh, my, my only reference point for music of saying, oh yeah, we know that music and we share it, 
again it's TikTok. <laughs> That's where I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I recognize that song. <laughs> it's been popular on TikTok. That's mm. and and sometimes it's Fleetwood Mac, which is a very old song, which is which is rather cool, mm -hmm. or it's more recent stuff. Anyway, I'm going all the way. <laughs> well, that's that's okay, and I think, and I mean, this is this is purely me theorizing. I don't know if this is actually true, but my feeling is that the chaos was there the whole time. It's just sort of been erased to make a cleaner story, so that we can, yes, of, of course, the '70s led to the '80s, to the '90s led to now. Um, <laughs> there was probably another decade in there. It's fine. Uh, but I, I think the, the, the chaos that we feel now has always been there. Maybe the internet has exacerbated the feeling of it in that we have that connectivity and we can absolutely find things. I mean, consider my own music collection. I've got this sort of, you know, I've got a synth wave deathcore from Toronto. I've got folk punk from from Europe. I've got, I've got all kinds of odd, odds and ends tucked away um, in, my, in my music collection now that I would never have found if my only source of music was the record store back in the 70s. And I think role-playing games coming of age, I guess, in this environment, it's going to be an interesting factor. I don't know that, I don't, I can't see the edges of it. I don't know how big that's gonna get. I don't know what people are gonna remember of this in 10 years. Who knows? Be like, I'm keen to find out. Remember those <laughs> two idiots on Twitch who talked about something and it changed everything, but people didn't realize it <laughs> until they were both like, dead <laughs> and, uh, and very uh, poor. But afterwards, people were like, those people who were yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. those two guys. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> How long do we just become prophets? Is this a religion now? <laughs> well, if we're not prophets, again. we need to change countries because you're not a prophet in your own country. But, uh... <laughs> no, but I think I agree with you, the, this idea that chaos was always there and it's just the light we shine on it afterwards, we simplify things. I mean, I love history podcasts and I just love things like uh you learn about uh there's the british history podcast which sort of sort of take the history of great britain in a chronological order and mm. i was fascinated how it described all we moved from the romans to uh, what followed which i'm i'm not even entirely sure anymore what what it was with the medieval ages mm. so you are in at school you've got this beautiful timeline and it tells you i don't know 476 that's the end of the roman age and that's the start of medieval time so like a, a farmer say hey right folks it's january 1st 476 we are yeah. done with roman stuff and that's it yeah. no we are fueled this is the dark ages it's gonna be great and then you, you learn the history and it's more like, okay, first, uh, it was not the, Ro the Empire, Roman Empire and then the Franks uh, with pretty much the proto-France. Uh, it was, no, you got the Roman Empire, then the, well, first they were the Republic, then the Empire, then it splintered in a way, it said, okay, I got governors, local governors who's got power, they got a little castle for them mm -hmm. and they collect taxes. So you're like, that's that's already feudal then that's that's pretty much yeah. it that's feudal uh and then mm -hmm. and then they got three emperors at once and you look at the three emperors you're like wait a minute there's one in uh, and i'm talking nonsense uh there's one in great britain one in france or there's one in germany one in france and one in rome you're like that's mm. that's the frank the the others and and the italians already and when the Frank and so on finally show up, they say, oh, we actually are descendants of the Romans. Yeah, so, we're so the Roman Empire. So, so th <laughs> there's, there's a chaos transition. <laughs> it's just, we Things said... are saying the same thing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, it's a, like, yeah, I love history. I love that you can dig and you never stop finding things. I think to loosely bring it back around, <laughs> I think... Role-playing games, for now, at least, like we're going to struggle uh, historically a little, I think, because we we are, we are the double ephemera of being both a text-based medium that is primarily circulated on the internet, and I don't know how stable the internet's going to be in the future. Um, when you consider something like music, you know, 
five thousand years later, we can find the the wreck of a Sumerian zither or what have you, and it's like, oh wow, that's that's the music they were playing. That's really interesting. In you know, like heck, heck or you can find vinyl records from the '60s, and it's like, oh wow, this is this still functions. It's uh, obscure, but we know how it works. I think role playing games now, uh, like our own historical. Re- record is going to be very frail because we are, we are so ephemeral like our, our own texts are reliant on this electronic media and will itch be around in five years these businesses change hands go under all the time it's like will we still have these marketplaces or yeah, these what, records of what we created what happens with the itch we'll closes we still have say, the okay, cthulhu book from the 70s yeah. cl- closing stores you've got five minutes <laughs> to to save your pdfs and you're like what is happening yeah. It's yeah. it's really weird indeed, and you, you know it's it's permeating into other media as well because I was mm-hmm. reading recently how Amazon they, they were making a case uh, in a in a court saying, well, hang on a minute, actually we don't sell the movies, so if you buy the movie from us, uh, actually our contract says that you don't own the movie, you just have access to it uh, indefinitely. But if we mm. stop giving you access to it, well, tough luck. That's it. It's it's not the DVD. It's not the your thirty five millimeter mm. film. You don't actually own anything. So there's a lot of stuff right now being, uh, even uh, when you're lucky, they they go through a new uh, remaster and you got the new four K remaster. Oh, that's brilliant. But move forward mm. in twenty years, maybe we'll like. Uh, what happened to that master? Well, I guess it was on a high drive somewhere, and then we stopped maintaining that hard drive, mm. so it got corrupted. So we don't we don't have that movie anymore. Mm. Well, I mean, it's it's a miracle that we have films like Nosferatu or Metropolis at all, because like these were neglected little film cans that people, you know, essentially escaped a, a, a copyright assassination attempt and were stowed away, and it's like they barely survived. And you think about how many films we lost. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, I think in the long game, we're probably going to see a similar thing, but uh, I don't want to make everyone sad. So I'm not going to think about that too much. Yeah, people don't realize how much we we lost and we keep losing. Uh, again, mm-hmm. another show I recommend, uh, you must remember this, uh, about uh, Hollywood, mm-hmm. the, the story of, uh, of cinema. And there's so many characters in that which are... They were those huge celebrities. Nobody's going to be as big as them ever because, again, we splintered. And they, they were the star. Like, um, mm. what was her name? Uh, oh, no, I forget her name. But, you know, like the biggest leading woman in silent movies. She was gigantic. She was the lady. And then half of movies are the gone. Anime Wong or...? Uh, Anna Marie Wong? No, 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 it was. Okay. What was her name? I don't think it was Gloria Swenson. It was uh, somebody oh, else. Oh, it's ringing bells, yeah. Mm. But yeah, it's. Mm. But it's... And then that was the new world. You know, like this, this new wild industry. <laughs> yeah. The... Concentrated, like you said before. Yeah. It's 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 funny also those uh those people I mean we 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 so focus on the now uh we just had a, a U.S. election which was very important for people outside of the U.S. and mm. and then who who remembers Jimmy Carter or uh, I mean <laughs> I, I remember reading the name of the guy who lost to uh who was it I think it was Ronald Reagan. Or, or no, mm. that might have been Carter, uh, or to the first Bush, who was probably not the first Bush, by the way. I don't know. And we just forgot the name of those people <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. gonna remember yeah. Matthew Mercer in uh, in thirty years. I mean, I wish him well, mm. but uh, you know mm. the yeah the big stars. Who's gonna remember Robert De Niro? Who who watches movies with Edward J. Robinson or J- James Cagney nowadays? Nobody, and mm. they they were the the big big stars. They were the the Chris Pratt, the, the Chris Hemsworth of their time, and and now they they're gone. They're forgotten by most people, mm. except nerds yeah. like you and me. 
Well, yeah, it's like those those, <laughs> those who dig. Um, and yeah, like the things that you find are so much stranger. And I look, I love that we are living through the strangeness. Like I, I love the things that we can find using this wonderful technology. <clears throat> well, I guess on... I guess if if anything has come from this slightly melancholy turn that the talk has taken, it's um, hold your own history, folks. Build little shrines. Uh, you know, something more resilient than electrons, because uh, I don't I don't trust them. I I don't think they're actually reliable. Yeah, we need, you know, we need good. Like uh, I remember in comic books, uh, Superman, but not only the the idea of you have data stored in crystals, and it's like you can, mm. it remains. It would because <laughs> yeah, even vinyls, film, uh, VHS tapes, all those stuff, the the old CDs, they go bad too fast. I would like someone to come up with okay, this is a, this is a per semi permanent storage system uh, and you can store data for at least the medium maybe you will you will lose the reader because that's another problem <laughs> because you might have the a digital file and the, the readers like i've got publisher which was a microsoft software my first mm. character sheets i ever made were publisher files and i don't think publisher mm. is around anymore uh, anyway we need yeah. to close <laughs> at this point <laughs> uh, all right Okay, Callum, I know what to get you for your birthday. If you can design a one-page RPG, we need to have it etched on a stone tablet oh, yeah. for you. <laughs> and we can bury it, and we will really confuse some future archaeologists. Well, you know, the, the stuff like that, uh, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, the, the Voynich uh, manuscript. There's a manuscript like that which is uh, reputed to be uh, impossible to decipher. And one of the jokes of XKCD was that might be a role playing game book from the 17th <laughs> yeah. century because it's <laughs> fake plants and and a bunch of weird stuff made up by someone who was really into uh, uh, biology. And the occult, yeah. Yeah, he it just is, made up someone's game notes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we should have Maybe. a. What, what is it called? This platform where you can order. Um, crafts and stuff uh when you you get plushies and things i mean there's a website it's like itch but it's sure. for etsy yeah. etsy i think etsy. I, think, yeah, yeah. I think we can start an etsy uh website where we offer to make stone tablets of your favorite one page tabletop rpg so you can have honey heist or crash pandas yeah. uh something like yeah. all of that <laughs> as a stone tablet and you yeah. put it in your garden yeah. and uh, again yeah. we confuse uh, the people in the the future which is yeah uh, we, we go on and on but... a very strange religion around dice <laughs> that, that's what is excellent also with the history and something most people forget about including uh professionals uh archaeologists and so on the, the people in the past didn't make more sense than we did <laughs> sometimes we find something it's like the deep <laughs> meaning of that carving yeah. means it's a fertility yeah. ritual no no yeah. someone drew <laughs> a penis on the wall yeah <laughs> <That's laughs> some... <laughs> sometimes it's still just bathroom graffiti <laughs> On that note, uh, Paddy, where can people find you? And uh, do we have one last thing to, to plug uh, and so on? Awesome. Yeah, look, uh, I'm Paddy Hutchinson. You can find me on Twitter at Paddy Hutcho uh, or you, more usually on the website liberationindustries.net. That's where all my podcasts live. Recently unleashed a Patreon. Once again, Paddy Hutchinson. My brand's my name. Um, so with that, for those of you who are in Australia, get clued into ArcanaCon. It's going to be a great time come January, and I will be swanning around there if you want to hang out and chat through the medium of uh, electrons that is so, so very frail. So not, not only people in Australia, everyone can take part, as long as they well, manage anyone... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, like you should tune in. It, it'll, it'll be a ride. I, I will ask these, you... These are all very cool people. I will ask you afterwards in uh, in private Twitter uh, to for for links of the stuff you mentioned, mm. and I will include everything in the description of this episode. So people go check them out. I will include a link 
to your itch web page. Is it called itch or itch.io? Because I'm always tempted to call it itch.io because of the .io. Yeah, it's always got the .io, but um, I, I, I usually say itch. Itch. So itch. Uh, yeah. So I'll put links to all of that in there. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, people, please uh, click the subscribe button on YouTube. I'm trying to be a proper YouTuber and always ask. I should do it in the middle like a big advertisement. Hey, now is the <laughs> moment to click like on this video and leave a comment. Uh, subscribe on us uh, anywhere also. Uh, come try my own game, Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring. And if you're a designer, contact me or Paddy and we will hook you up with uh, Jason Pitre, who's that because that's how we met. Uh, it's got a, a mm. very nice uh, three game designer lounges at different three different time zones, so you can uh, we can engage and make the theory of the future mm. of role playing game uh, together, or just ramble like we did uh, today mainly. Thanks, yeah, Paddy, and uh, bye Thank everyone. Thank you, Callum. It's been a great time. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Good hunting. <laughs>